small engine running. <laughs> Absolute genius. Get this. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> this is the show where we bring you science. Back. What that essentially means is discovery is advances, the questions, research, technology, unbelievable. Without further ado, this is The Naked Scientist. Hello and welcome to the show where we bring you the latest breakthroughs in science, technology and medicine. I'm Eva Higginbotham and in this week's programme, it's Q&A time. Can animals really sense impending dangers like storms and earthquakes? How do anti-glare phone screen covers actually work? And in light of the humanitarian crises going on in Afghanistan and Haiti, what can we do to reduce disease outbreaks in the months to come? The Naked Scientist podcast is powered by UKfast.co.uk. With us this week, we have four members of our expert panel who's going to be answering questions for us. Animal behaviour expert and author Joe Wimpenny, who's just written a book looking into whether there's any truth to the animals written about in our favourite childhood fairy tales, Aesop's Fables. So briefly, Joe, could a tortoise really beat a hare in a race? I'm going to give you the least satisfying answer probably in uh, behavioural biology, which is that it depends. <laughs> Such and I go into life. that in the chapter. There may be some surprises in there. Mm, moving on, we also have Kyle Harper from the University of Oklahoma, who is unusually for our show, a historian. But we won't hold it against him as he actually studies the history of infectious diseases and has recently written a book all about the topic. Welcome, Kyle. And I think you have young children, so I imagine you're also somewhat of an expert in modern day infectious diseases, too. Of course, being a human parent means being very familiar with every form of the the sniffles and uh, unfortunately all sorts of what we call tummy bugs uh, on a more or less non-stop basis. <laughs> yes. And we also have with us physicist and nanomaterials expert Jess Wade from Imperial College London. She's joined us on the show pre-pandemic. So welcome back, Jess. What's been your favourite bit of new science in the physics world recently? My favourite bit of new science was using a recent demonstration of using chiral materials to inject spin polarised electrons into the active layer of a light emitting device and making them just much more efficient. And it's a super cool demonstration of something that could transform technology. Wow, that sounds incredibly exciting. What does chiral mean here? Chiral materials are really fascinating, actually. They exist as non-superimposable mirror images of one another, so like our left and our right hand. Wonderful. And finally, we have insect lover and studier Dave Goulson with us from the University of Sussex, and he's just written a book about how insects are faring at the moment. So, Dave, I know this is probably a very difficult question for someone with your proclivities, but what is your favourite insect? Oh, uh Bumblebees, I have to say. I've been studying bumblebees for about 30 years. So, um, yeah, they're, they're very handsome, furry, large, colourful, very important ecologically and very clever. They're kind of the intellectual giants of the insect world. Oh, I look forward to hearing more about them later. Now, before we dive into the questions, guys, we have got a guess who quiz or guess what quiz running throughout the show. I'm going to be giving you clues across the hour. So if you're listening in at home, see if you can beat the panel to identify this mystery thing. Here is your first clue. All right, Jess. Who or what made that sound? It sounded like trees falling down in a forest. Good, good guess. Good guess. Not quite right, but we'll be giving you more clues later on in the show. And sticking with you, Jess, let's start off with you for a question from listener Joe, who's asked, when it's sunny, it's hard to make out what's on my phone screen, even when it's on the highest brightness setting. I've seen that there are anti-glare phone covers. How do they actually work? Yeah, this is actually a perfect question for me because these are the kind of materials that I research. The reason that you want an anti-glare phone cover is because when you're outside on a sunny day like Joe is, even if you turn your brightness up really high, the light from behind you, so the sunlight, or if you're at home, just light around you, goes through all of the different layers of your mobile phone, your screen, the optics, the thing that's emitting the light, and it gets to something at the back. And that thing at the back is usually an electrode. It's somewhere that we inject the charges. But crucially, it's made of metal, so it's shiny. 
So what your sunlight behind you does is hits off that shiny layer at the back and interrupts the image that you're trying to look at or the text message that you're trying to read. So what these anti-glare filters do, as, as Joe suggests, they're quite sophisticated optical components, and they basically take that unpolarized light from behind you. They turn it into something called circularly polarized light, which is light where the electric field rotates out a kind of corkscrew shape. They turn it into one handedness of that. So maybe they turn it into left handed circularly polarized light that hits off that metal electrode at the back, becomes right handed and then gets stuck behind the anti glare filter. It can't get out. So what your anti glare filter does is effectively polarize the light and trap it inside your display so that you have much clearer resolution and higher contrast when you're looking at an image. Without it, that ambient light would distort what you're trying to look at. The light that gets trapped then, does that turn into heat? Where does it go? Does it dissipate? It just kind of bounces around. So it just bounces around inside the display, inside all of the different structures. It probably hits off the electrodes again and a little bit will invert the handedness again and then come out. But really, there are so many layers of potential optical loss in your mobile phone. And what we're trying to do on a developing new material side is make sure that they're as streamlined and as efficient as possible. So the light that comes out can all bypass the screen if we want it to but gets stuck in the screen if we don't want it to distort what we're looking at. And so do phones already have anti-glare filters fitted or can we buy extra good ones to stick on the phone screen if you wanted to read on the beach or something? You for sure can buy extra good ones. I, I'm not entirely sure of the optics of all of the different ones that you'd buy, but there are really easy physics experiments you could do to try and understand exactly what they're, what they're trying to perform. But actually all smartphones, anything with an OLED organic light emitting diode display should have one of these anti-glare filters inside it anyway. And what we're trying to do on the kind of OLED side, the OLED design side, is make them as efficient as possible. So to make them emit actually twisted light so it can get through that anti-glare filter. So circularly polarized OLEDs are a massive thing and it's amazing that Joe managed to ask such a perfect question. Brilliant. Thanks, Jess. And speaking of sunny weather, Dave, you work on insects and the environment. And Nancy has been wondering, with the new IPCC report saying temperatures are going to rise by at least 1.5 degrees, how is that going to affect insects? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Not overall, probably not going to be great news for them, as you might guess. There'll be some insects that probably enjoy it, the kind of pesty insects like houseflies and mosquitoes that can breed fast, they're adaptable, they have big populations, and they will probably just thrive. But sadly, the majority of the species that we would want to keep will do less well. Some will just not like the warmer weather. So my favourites, the bumblebees, they're big furry creatures adapted to cold climates, and they, they simply overheat in warm weather, and they're already starting to shift away from the warmer parts of their ranges. You might think a lot of other insects, like butterflies, might benefit from warmer weather, but the evidence is that they're not. And it's probably because so historically, their ranges will have tended to shift towards the poles as it got warmer in previous climatic warming events. But now they're, they're existing in very fragmented habitats, so they can't just gently move northwards because they've got to cross huge expanses of hostile habitat, farmland, motorways, housing estates, to get to the next little fragment of good habitat. So, yeah, it's just one more stress that, that insects could really do without, and it's, for most of them, bad news, I'm afraid. And so is climate change in general a big driver of the insect loss? How many insects are we at risk of losing with climate change? Well, we are seeing a massive decline in, in abundance of, of insects. Many insects have fallen in numbers by 50% or more in the last few decades. Probably most of that's been driven by a habitat loss, primarily the growth of pesticide use in farming and gardens and so on, and things like light pollution and invasive species and a whole bunch of other factors. And climate change is starting to kick in now, and there's growing evidence that it's beginning to have an impact. But obviously, Unfortunately, that impact is likely to, to get much worse as climate change accelerates into the future. And you mentioned different insects ending up in different locations. Can we expect any insects from the sort of warmer regions now to end up in countries like the UK, which are a little bit cooler? 
Yeah, we can. I mean, in fact, a few have already invaded from, from the south. And so we do every year get one or two new species turning up. And we may also rather worryingly have malaria spreading mosquitoes back in Britain within the not too distant future, which, which would not be good news. Not at all. Thanks very much. Kyle, one for you now. Just in the last few weeks, there's been the hugely damaging earthquake in Haiti, reported to have killed more than 1,200 people already, and now devastating reports of the Taliban taking control in Afghanistan, which is bound to lead to mass migration and the formation of temporary camps and difficult living conditions. And lots of people are worried that this is going to lead to more disease outbreaks. We're wondering, during humanitarian crises like these, what makes disease outbreaks more likely to become a big problem? Right. And unfortunately, conflict and humanitarian crises are very favorable for the transmission of infectious diseases. So pathogens that are, whether viruses or bacteria, parasites that have to transmit between hosts really benefit from situations in which human beings are crowded. And that's one of the the main drivers of transmission in times of crisis. But there are other things too. If you think of the kinds of things that happen in crisis, we know that it leads to breakdowns in systems of, of hygiene and sanitation. And so much of our daily lives and sort of unspoken routines and the infrastructure that we rely on for clean water, things that we're privileged often in the developed world to take for granted, but that have helped humans gain a kind of partial and fragile control over infectious diseases, those systems tend to break down, particularly access to clean water becomes more difficult, sometimes in situations where it's already very limited or fragile in conditions where you have refugees crowded into camps or people migrating in desperate circumstances. It also is partly due to the fact that these sorts of circumstances tend simply to to undermine human biological well-being all around. So if people are hungry, it makes it much harder for their bodies to fight off infection. So they become more susceptible to, to infection and severe disease. And are there any examples throughout history where people have actually managed to mitigate some of these risks and prevent big disease outbreaks in these conditions? I mean, I think in many ways, the one way to understand the last few centuries is interplay between infectious diseases that get in some ways bigger and more virulent and more dangerous and humans collectively responding, bringing together science, enlightened policy to tackle what really are collective challenges. And this is one of the tricky things that, of course, we're, we're living through with, with COVID-19 is realizing how public health is public. Our health is very intricately tied together. And so it requires political solutions to, to address these kinds of challenges. But yes, I mean, I think one of the real triumphs of humanity is figuring out how to, to bring science to work together to, to do things like create giant sewage systems that handle the problem of, of human waste and that deliver clean water. So from quarantine and lockdowns, which, which go back to the, the late Middle Ages through the rise of modern public health infrastructure and compulsory notification and vaccination, Humans have done a good job at many times working together to address these kinds of challenges, but obviously we're not all the way there yet and we still face very grave threats to to our collective well-being. And our thoughts are very much with those currently affected. From baffling British weather sideways spines of the vertebrae coming off here to looking at a cheetah from the inside out, games making their way to the clinic and what to eat in your garden. Mm. The Naked Scientists In Short podcasts bring you a top-up of short, compelling science stories. Listen and download for free at nakedscientist.com slash short or subscribe to Naked Specials wherever you get your podcasts. Today, we have a panel of experts taking on your science questions. So if there's something you've always wanted to know for a show like this, give us a try and email chris at thenakedscientist.com or tweet at Naked Scientists. Still to come, which of our favourite foods are particularly at risk as insect pollinators disappear? Are foxes really sly and cunning? And if the universe is really expanding, what on earth is it expanding into? In the meantime, here is the next part of our Guess Who game for our listeners and guests. First, we heard a noise that it makes. Take another listen. And now for clue two. 
While I make this sound thousands of times a year, it sometimes makes the news, and there's even big budget films about me. Joe, any thoughts? Oh, big budget films. Mm, I I don't know. I mean, my first thought is is volcanoes, but they don't make that sound. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good idea. So yeah. It's random. Um, I have nothing else to add. <laughs> volcanoes is good we've had trees we've had volcanoes not quite right but good thinking on the right lines everybody and coming to you joe there's been a long debate going on about whether animals like dogs or frogs can sense earthquakes or other natural disasters that are about to happen can you put this to bed for us can animals really tell when something like a storm is coming or an earthquake Mm, i love this question there are so many anecdotes on this topic so many reports of people seeing animals fleeing from an area or doing something abnormal and then an earthquake happening or then a big storm hitting. And I know of one study of frogs in Italy, they were being monitored for their breeding behavior anyway and an earthquake hit so that the researchers did have the pre, the during and the post data and they found that 96% of the frogs abandoned the pond that they were in about five days before the earthquake hit. They left and then they came back about 10 days later. So it does seem that they were responding to something, they were detecting something in their environment, but we don't know enough about what that would be and we don't have the prospective controlled experiments, I think, to be able to to properly put that to bed, as you said. Jess? Yeah, I just wondered, it reminds me so much of that work led by Professor Padita Baran at the University of Manchester looking for early diagnosis of Parkinson's and doing it by scent. You know, there was the phenomenal people who whose noses are trained to be able to recognise changes in smell. And you can actually predict someone has Parkinson's disease for which there are very few diagnostic tests by smelling them and you can get it super early. And, and I guess animals are very attuned to all of that. And we have dogs. I mean, there's a big line of research in medical detection dogs. I think there are certain types of tumours where people produce compounds which dogs can detect on their breath. Animals have pretty incredible sensory abilities. I would say there's no reason that they can't respond to these things. Um, But yeah, it's still a little bit of a grey area. And people have even been doing studies using dogs to try and sniff out COVID. There's been a variety going through in the airport or possibly in in hospitals or in the line for a club. People have all sorts of ideas of where these could be used. Jess, back to you, because Douglas has been in touch to ask, I wear a watch that measures my heart rate using light. How does that work? And do you think we'll be able to monitor more things with tech like this in the future? Yeah, sure. Actually, your watch is remarkably sophisticated and it can measure lots of different things. The heart rate monitor is interesting. It uses light to measure kind of changes in pressure in your arteries. So it's it's called the photoplasmography sensor and it shines a light on your arteries and your wrist is a good place to put it because there's a lot of blood nearby and you can detect it quite easily. It shines the light on that and it looks at the light that's reflected. So there's kind of light out and then there's a detector on the watch as well. And when your heart beats, the the kind of main chamber of your heart, which I think is your left, according to my GCSE biology, pushes this pulse of blood around your body that causes these arteries to kind of temporarily swell. And when they swell up, they change the way that light is reflected back into your your watch, your mobile phone or whatever it is that you're using it to measure your heart rate. It can also hopefully measure changes in pressure, which is useful for people who have hypertension, because you can look at the amplitude of that signal. And then a bunch of kind of clever algorithms designed by whoever made your watch will convert those signals that they're getting into an actual heart rate. I think the other things that your watch can already do probably is measure the the blood oxygen levels. So to measure the amount of oxygen in your blood. And that's something called the pulse oximeter, which is, again, a technology that's been really useful and important with COVID that looks at how much light is absorbed by your blood. And we can use that to, to look at how high your blood oxygen levels are. And particularly in people with coronavirus, they got very low. So it was a really good warning sign that they were suffering from the disease. But in the future, I see so many different applications of kind of wearable technology and almost everyone I speak to has a new idea every day, you know, making 
blood glucose testing, less invasive, being able to detect and monitor for diseases early, kind of coming into what Joe was saying about maybe changes in a scent or a biomarker that you could trace. People are doing absolutely extraordinary things. You know, there's a fantastic research group in Northwestern University in the States led by a guy called John Rogers. And he develops tech for monitoring the rehab of stroke patients, develops tech for looking at all different kind of deep tissue blood levels and things like that, which are quite hard to monitor because they're deep inside you, but can tell us a whole bunch about different diseases that you can have. So so I, I see it as this kind of beautiful area of really biology and physicians working with material scientists and physicists to see where technology could be applied and then use it to make doctors and patients' lives easier. I, I really love it. <laughs> It's amazing to think how much data we must be creating, everyone wearing their watches and the heart rate being stored somewhere in a cloud, somewhere in a server, some way. As we get further and further along, we're going to end up with such an enormous amount of data. We'll need the computer scientists to be developing new ways to store data more effectively too. They're, they're already doing that. And I think particularly in kind of rapid analysis of MRI images for the diagnosis of breast cancer, people are making really, really clever algorithms now to be able to identify things earlier and then be able to come in with a proper treatment plan. But I think I think it's incredibly exciting how much we're generating and really not only from a medical imaging perspective, but from a making your doctor's life easier perspective. You know, you don't have to go physically into the hospital as much if you've got something monitoring your rehabilitation from a stroke because that data can be sent wirelessly and efficiently to your doctor that doctor can make a call about what you need to do next and then send you that information so I think it's not just making our health easier but it's also kind of making our lives easier and society easier. Yeah and speaking about health systems. Kyle, back to you. Some people have said that the COVID pandemic has been so bad, partly because it isn't worse. That is, if there were fewer asymptomatic people, then it would spread less and overall mortality could be lower. We tend to think of the bubonic plague as the actual worst of the worst in terms of pandemics. Was it really the worst? Well, it depends on what you mean by worst. And if you mean the worst infectious disease in terms of total mortality, it's probably not actually plague, but it's something like tuberculosis or malaria that uh, while they cause more suffering and death than probably any other infectious diseases. If you mean the worst infectious disease in terms of pain and suffering, it'd be very hard to say. You'd probably want to put syphilis on the list before it was treatable. It was a pretty miserable scourge on human societies. And tertiary syphilis, sort of very advanced syphilis, was so bad they used to treat it with malaria. In fact, uh, a scientist won a Nobel Prize for coming up with malaria therapy. Luckily, antibiotics uh, were discovered soon after. That's a, if you're just talking about what epidemics cause the, the most extreme sudden mortality events, then it would either be plague or influenza. Uh, the the 1918 19 influenza probably killed more people, but also global population was larger than even the great plague pandemics of the past. But if you're talking about the proportion of a population that succumbed to a disease on a on a short time frame, then it probably is bubonic plague, which is a a bacterial disease caused by Yersinia pestis. That's a very strange germ. It's really a rodent disease that is transmitted by fleas, uh, although it can be transmitted directly by droplets between humans as well. Uh, but it causes the Black Death. It causes plague outbreaks uh, in Europe down to the 17th uh, and even early 18th century uh, in parts of the Mediterranean Near East, even later than that. Uh, and it probably does more damage than than any other disease. It's a really kind of mind-boggling phenomenon to try and even imagine. The, the Black Death, we know, killed half the population in very significant areas. And you just sort of compare that to, to COVID-19 and think of the disruption that it's caused our society, which, of course, is very different. Our society depends on the basic control of infectious disease, of course. But... Even so, I think it is, as someone who thinks about past societies, it's, it's such a challenge to imagine what it must have really been like to live in a, in a city or a country where in the space of a year, half the people 
were simply gone. Thanks, Kyle. Much has changed for business owners, managers, and staff recently. But with over 30 years experience in telecommunications, award-winning independent company Spitfire have the expertise to make sure you stay ahead and can keep on innovating. Whether it's connectivity, MPLS networks, firewalls, or phone systems, Spitfire can help. To find out more, go to spitfire.co.uk. That's spitfire.co.uk. Spitfire, telecoms and IP engineering solutions for business since 1988. Music in the program is sponsored by Epidemic Sound. Perfect music for audio and video productions. In this episode, I am joined by a panel of experts. We've got animal behaviour and fairy tale expert Joe Wimpenny, infectious diseases historian Kyle Harper, nanomaterials lover and physicist extraordinaire Jess Wade, and insect obsessor Dave Goulson. Let's return to our Guess Who competition now. First, we heard a noise. Let's have a reminder. Your clues so far were, while I make this sound thousands of times a year, it sometimes makes the news and there's ever even been big budget films about me. Your next clue is, you'll hear me carving, but you'll never hear me mooing. Dave? It's ice sheets, isn't it? I think lumps of big lumps of ice cracking off and falling into the sea or something like that. I can't think what the movie is, but, but uh, that's what I'm going for. Good thought, Dave. We'll hold that thought for now. Let's see what comes up with our next clue coming up later. Now, as we always do, we have a little quiz at this point in the programme and you can play along at home too. I'm splitting you guys into teams. You're now going to be two teams of two. Jess and Dave, you're team one. Kyle and Joe, you are team two. And you can, of course, confer to see what you think the answer might be. Now, August is the eighth month of the year, so this week's quiz is all about the number eight. And in round one, two of the answers are true and one is false. And we need you to pick the false one. Jess and Dave, the first question is for you. Oxygen is the eighth element in the periodic table. Which of the following about oxygen is not true? A. Oxygen is the tenth most abundant element in the universe. B. Oxygen is not flammable. Or C. Liquid oxygen is blue. What do you reckon? Ooh, Jess. I, my immediate reaction is that it's not flammable because it's, it's kind of necessary for things to burn. But, but then you're the physicist, so I'm guessing this is probably maybe your territory, not mine. I don't know, because my, fa- my favourite element by far is carbon. I feel like I could have nailed any answer on carbon and <laughs> oxygen. I'm like, I'm going to offend all the chemists I work with every single day. Um, yeah, I'm happy to go with what you suggest, Dave. Let's go with that. So B, oxygen is not flammable. That's your answer? Yeah. Fingers crossed. I'm afraid you're wrong. It's actually A. Oxygen is actually the third most abundant element, not the tenth. Liquid oxygen is indeed light blue. And while oxygen makes other things burn much more vigorously, pure oxygen itself doesn't burn. Instead, it's called an oxidizer. Kyle and Joe, here is your first question. All arachnids have eight legs. Which of the following animals are not arachnids? A. Ticks. B, scorpions, or C, spider crabs? Well, ticks are definitely arachnids. Yep. <clears throat> Trying to think of... I would go with spider crabs, but yeah. I'm also quite worried that as a zoologist, I definitely should know this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's spider crabs. I think you're right. Let's go for it. You're correct. Spider crabs are crustaceans and they have 10 legs. Ticks, scorpions, mites and spiders are all arachnids. And recently we realised that horseshoe crabs are neither horseshoes nor crabs, but are also arachnids. Time for round two, which is all about unusual units of measurement. Jess and Dave, get ready. Your first question is, in imperial measurements, eight of which unit make up a mile? A, rod. B, chain. Or C, furlong? Ooh, well, we're under pressure, aren't we, after the first one? I hesitate to say, because the honest truth is that I haven't got a clue. If, if a, a total guess from me, Jess, would be furlong, but I really am clutching at straws or chains or rods or something. So we've got rod, chain or furlong? Yeah. I'm going with 
furlong. And I should get that because I'm a physicist and I work at Imperial. So can we please go to go? <laughs> yeah, well, we agree, even if we don't really know the answer. Let's go with it. You're correct. It's C. There are four rods in a chain, 10 chains in a furlong and eight furlongs in a mile. Furlong, as everyone knows now, furlong means furrow length, and it was the length a team of oxen could plough before needing a rest. So there you go. Kyle and Joe, your question now. On the Beaufort scale, how are force eight wind speeds described? A, is it a breeze? B, is it a gale? Or C, is it a hurricane? Oh dear, I... I don't think I know much about this. But I'm assuming that it, they get more severe as you go higher. Yeah, so it's a gale? You think it's a gale? I'd go gale then. The middle sounds safe. Let's do it. Correct. It is B. The Beaufort scale is a scale from 0 to 12, where 0 is completely calm and 12 is a hurricane. 8 is a gale. And on land, it describes when twigs break off trees generally impedes progress. At sea, foam is blown in well-marked streaks along the direction of the wind. So if you notice any foam blowing in a certain direction, you can say, ah, I know this is a rated eight wind speed and is a gale. Wonderful. Well done. So what have we got now? We've got two points to team two and one point to team one. So there's all to play for. Round three, we've got a supermarket suite. Sorry, supermarket sweep. For our final round, we're really testing your credibility as experts and seeing if you know your apples from your oranges. Jess and Dave, according to a YouGov survey in 2021, which is the eighth most popular fruit in the UK? Is it A, green grapes, B, lemons, or C, clementines? Oh gosh, this is so hard. Do you think people were really told lemons was an option or do you think they were just asked for their favourites? Because I think if they were asked, they wouldn't naturally think of a lemon. Uh, I think I, I would guess not lemon, but I'm really struggling over the other two. Um, both is. quite nice. I'm happy to have, <laughs> eat either. I have a feeling it's clementines. I think grapes score higher. OK, I'd be very happy to go with that guess. Yeah. <laughs> Correct. It is clementines. You're right. Green grapes do score higher. They are third and lemons are ninth. So there you go. They are close, close to clementines there. Kyle and Joe, you have a similar question with this time about vegetables. In the same poll, what was the eighth most popular vegetable in the UK? Is it A, red onions, B, broccoli or C, sweet corn? It better not be sweet corn or else I'm embarrassed. <laughs> it's the the worst i agree actually um i would say broccoli would go higher i like i like that i don't know that we've had an, any a answers yet i'm just going on like what mm -hmm. no ours was an a our first answer was an a um, and red onions are a staple of so many dishes i do not believe they'd score that badly would they be a favorite though they're just like necessary aren't they i'm overthinking no, this they'd, they'd be my number one shall we just go broccoli let's do Oh. It is actually red onions. Broccoli scored sixth and sweet corn was 20th. So Jess, you'll be pleased the country has not let you down. Um, I'm also happy for broccoli. I'm really glad. And if my calculations are correct, that means we've got two points each on each side, which means it is time for the tie break. Now, for this round, for this question, the closest team to the correct answer wins. Eight is the largest cube number in the Fibonacci sequence, which is the one where you add the previous two numbers together. So one, one, two, three, five, eight, thirteen, etc. What is the largest square number in the Fibonacci sequence? What do you reckon? Take it, take a take a punt. I'm I'm in your hands on this. I'm I feel a physicist has a better chance than a biologist here. Could you just choose any square number above a hundred and we'll go for that? 144. All right, Joe and Kyle. I was thinking 256. Oh, I am. Um, go with it. All right, guys. In that case, Dave and Jess, you're right. It is 12 squared. It is 144. You are now crowned the Naked Scientist Big Boffin Brains of the week. Congratulations. You can go tell your families that you won. Bye, that was lucky. Going to. <laughs> <laughs>
And now back to the questions, Dave, and a little bit more seriously now. One of the consequences of the insect apocalypse that we hear about is the lack of pollinators for future crops. Are there any foods in particular that are going to be sensitive to this? Hopefully not red onions or clementines. Uh, yeah, they're... <laughs> There are an awful lot, actually. Those aren't included, but roughly three quarters of the crops that we grow in the world need pollination to some extent, uh, meaning that that the yield is increased by pollination. So everything from apples and cherries to blueberries, strawberries, raspberries, loads of vegetables like courgettes and pumpkins and squash and tomatoes and chili peppers, even coffee and chocolate depend upon insect <gasps> pollinators oh, no. so yeah disaster yeah. Um, so i mean there are an awful lot i think actually the one that if i had to pick a crop which is likely to be the first one to suffer from a shortage of pollinators it's probably going to be almonds and i say that because about 80 percent of the world's almonds are grown in northern california in one small region and it's very intensively managed there are very few wild pollinators almost every honeybee hive in north america is shipped to california for the almond pollination in february and there's just about enough there's about two and a half million hives taken to california every year and that's just adequate to pollinate the almonds but if anything happens to those honeybees if there's you know some any kind of disease outbreak or anything else then there won't be enough and the almond yield will plummet and the price of almonds would go up which i'm sure we could all cope with but they would be the first sign of much worse things to come i'm afraid including no hot chocolate or coffee that is an absolutely enormous number of hives to ship across is that basically all the hives in the u.s yeah yeah absolutely it's almost every one and they pay um it's it's about 300 dollars a hive to rent them just for the for three weeks while the almonds flowering so it's, it's a huge business and a big uh, money spinner for the beekeepers um, but as I say it's it's right on the edge of uh, you know what's possible and it seems like we really have put all our eggs in one basket in that particular example. And we'll be hearing a little bit later about how we might be able to prevent some of these insect pollinators from um, uh, from disappearing. Thanks Dave. Before more questions, it is now time for the fourth and final clue for Guess Who. First, we had a noise. And then we've had some extra clues, including there are big budget films about me. You'll hear me carving but never mooing. And our final clue, the biggest thing I've produced was the size of Jamaica. Kyle? I'll say uh, goats. (laughs) 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 They certainly don't move. They certainly don't move. You're correct there. All right, we'll come back to the final answer right at the end. And Joe, now over to you. Ellie's been in touch and she said, I love when foxes come into my garden, but people always speak of them as being sort of wily with phrases like sly as a fox. Is there any truth to that? Are foxes really cunning? Yes, it's a very, very persistent characterization of foxes. And it's one that goes back millennia. I'm not even sure that we we could ever know when this idea of foxes being cunning and crafty um, and sly first came about. But certainly several of Aesop's fables include fox characters. They're pretty consistently portrayed as the quick-witted animal that's always tricking others to, to get out of trouble. In the second century, Roman author Aelian He referred to foxes as crafty creatures um, and masters of trickery. He even talked about foxes plotting against hedgehogs, which I love. And so, yeah, we, we kind of have this wonderful collective consciousness, I suppose, that of foxes as being this, the words just sort of go together so easily. If we get to the actual science and focus on fox biology, What we know is that these are highly adaptable, opportunistic animals. So what looks a bit like craftiness or cunning actually boils down to certain biological traits. The fact that they will eat pretty much anything. They're not fussy in any way. They've evolved really, really specialized predatory senses to um, to catch very specialized rodent escapers. They're rapid learners. We know that they can, for example, learn to avoid crossing 
roads in cities during the daytime and they'll only do it after midnight which coincides with when there's less traffic on the roads they can remember where they've stashed food and recover that food appropriately uh, and they can be bold and exploratory and particularly in the human environment they've adapted incredibly well to the presence of humans you know they've learned how we operate how we behave and they've capitalized on it so that they can exploit our environment so all of that package together probably gives the impression that they're using their wits to get ahead but actually there aren't very many scientific studies looking at fox cognitive abilities and there's certainly no evidence that I know of that shows that foxes can uh, use tactical deception to get ahead. So maybe keep the fantastic in the fantastic Mr. Fox. Um, Back to you, Jess. If the universe is expanding, what is it expanding into? And I love this question because I have always wondered. It's such a good question with such an annoying answer because it's really expanding into itself. If you think about the universe as being the universe, it's just, expanding the thing on the edge of the if the universe is everything what's on the edge of the universe is the universe and what's on the edge of that is also the universe and you go layers and layers and layers and can freak yourself out with how much universe there is the way that we're taught it in undergraduate physics is you kind of imagine that you draw a grid of dots onto a balloon and then you blow up the balloon and the space between the dots is expanding, right? But if you're standing in any one of those dots, which could represent a galaxy, you see everything else receding away from you, kind of traveling away from you really fast. So it's just like that, the universe, it's just like blowing up a balloon. And I'm sorry that that's not a better answer, but you'll have to go to some general relativity lectures to understand properly why. I'm always impressed by physicists' ability to sit with such an uncomfortable truth and still go about their day-to-day lives. That's fantastic. Um, Moving back to you, Kyle, some people have been pointing to a global pandemic that took place in the late 1800s that we used to think was a form of flu. But now some are saying it could actually have been a coronavirus. What is the story there? It's an interesting question, and uh, at this point, still a a kind of speculative hypothesis. But we know that about a generation before the Spanish flu, there was a global pandemic that people at the time considered influenza. And it's actually interesting in a lot of ways because it's the first global pandemic where you have a really fairly robust global network of, of instant communication. And so the news can travel and people actually can perceive the pandemic in real time as it's happening. So it's actually, the word pandemic existed before that, but it's actually when the word sort of becomes a a household term. Uh, It was not quite as nasty as the Spanish flu, but it was still a pretty severe disease with with a lot of morbidity and mortality. Moved very fast, respiratory disease. So the thinking has always been, this it's called the Russian flu. Uh, It was believed to have originated somewhere in Russia or Central Asia. And the the thinking has always been, this was was kind of one of these global waves of, of influenza, which is a reasonable hypothesis and I think still probably the most likely one. But obviously, we're pretty interested in coronaviruses now. And there are actually many species of coronavirus. There's four species of coronavirus that are endemic in human populations. They circulate uh, constantly. Most of us have probably had a a coronavirus or two even before the the COVID-19 pandemic. And they cause pretty mild respiratory disease and the common cold. And the study of one of these coronavirus species, it's called OC43, which is kind of unimaginative, shows that it's most closely related to a bovine coronavirus. So there were probably in the recent past a common ancestor that infected cows. And when it crosses the species barrier, it adapts to humans and becomes endemic in human populations. Scientists can use a uh, a technique known as molecular clock dating that's an analysis of how long it would have taken for certain evolutionary changes to accumulate. And so by measuring the the genetic differences between human coronavirus OC43 and its close relative bovine coronavirus, it's been estimated that this evolutionary divergence happened around 1890, which means that there should be some new respiratory disease in human populations right around the time there's this big dramatic global pandemic. So people have said, maybe that wasn't influenza. Maybe it was the emergence of this new species of coronavirus as a, as a human disease. I think that's 
perfectly logical on kind of evolutionary grounds. Uh, but it's still, it's still, as far as I know, nobody's been able to, to prove it. And I'll just say that it's the kind of thing that is now potentially provable. Genome sequencing technologies uh, are so powerful that it's increasingly possible to, to recover fragments of, of pathogen uh, DNA or even RNA from past samples, whether from archaeological samples, from skeletal remains, or from uh, sometimes formaldehyde-preserved tissues. So measles virus has been recovered from the very early 20th century. And I think there's surely someone uh, out there could find uh, potentially a, a, a lung tissue of somebody who died in, in the early 1890s, and it might be possible to test genetically and really get smoking gun evidence, whether it was influenza or coronavirus. So it's it's an interesting question to think about. We don't really know. We could potentially, if someone's lucky enough to find a museum specimen, uh, be able to recover the, the genome of the pathogen. But until then, it'll just sort of remain an interesting speculation. And it is interesting to think about a, a possible parallel for the emergence of a, of a new coronavirus and to think about what does happen when one of these enters human populations and then unfortunately comes to stay. Amazing to think what uh, secrets of scientific history might be hiding away, just waiting to be discovered if someone would test them. Thanks very much, Kyle. Dave, now back to you. Is there anything that we can do at home to try and prevent the insect apocalypse, as you've termed it? Yeah, I, absolutely. I, the, the final quarter of Silent Earth, my new book, is all about what we can do. And in a way, it's quite nice because a lot of environmental issues, you know, people feel pretty helpless and sort of whatever you can do doesn't seem significant. But because insects live all around us, they're in our gardens and parks and so on, and most of them haven't gone extinct, and if we just look after them better, they can recover really quickly, then actually it's really nice because people can get involved, they can do things, and they can see those things working. So I mean, the obvious thing, if you're lucky enough to have a garden, is to make that wildlife friendly, to plant some bee and butterfly friendly flowers, be more tolerant of or often called weeds, but which are basically native wildflowers. Don't spray any pesticides. Don't mow your lawn too often. Turn it into a wildflower meadow. Have a little pond, a bee hotel and so on. And in no time at all, you've got your own miniature insect haven in your back garden. And, and literally thousands of species can live in a garden. It's quite incredible. Then if you haven't got a garden, well, a window box is better than nothing. Grow a bit of marjoram in a pot and, and at least some bees and butterflies will be happy. Or you can get involved in local campaigns. Uh, for example, there's an organization called Pesticide Action Network that are championing pesticide-free towns, and there are lots of local campaigns to do that. And in, in fact, I have a, a government petition I launched last week urging government to ban the use of pesticides in towns, which um, I'd urge anyone to, to sign if they think that's a good idea. But also there are campaigns locally to put more flowers into parks and road verges and roundabouts and those kinds of things, which I think is, is a really nice use of what's otherwise rather boring moan space. And finally, you know, think about the sort of big picture of the impact you have when you go to the supermarket. So if you buy organic food, that reduces the number of pesticides being used. If you buy local seasonal produce, you're generally reducing your impact eat less meat reduces your impact you know we can all do these little things and if we all if enough people did them then it would really make a big difference thanks very much dave and finally joe scientists have shown that some birds like crows are really really clever how do we actually measure cleverness and if they are really clever how do they fit that into what are ultimately very small brains hmm. It's a great question. So crows are members of the corvid family of birds. That includes the ravens, uh, magpies, jays, rooks, and others. And it's fair to say that over the last 20 to 30 years, they've really risen in prominence and got a bit of a reputation for being really, really clever birds. So the first thing to say, I think, is what do we mean by clever? Um, what is intelligence? These are questions that are not easily answered. They are things that have plagued the field since the earliest days. You could still have an entire conference on the topic of animal intelligence and what it actually is, and actually human intelligence. We don't know how to easily define it even for our own species. So being able to roll a definition out to animals is really, really difficult. That means that there's no single gold standard test 
for intelligence that we can just roll out across the animal kingdom and compare them and rank animals in terms of, of cleverness. So the consensus seems to be that when we talk about intelligence, um, we're really talking about a package of different abilities which animals use to solve problems in their environments. So that could be rapid learning speed, the ability to generalize, the ability to solve problems creatively or insightfully, flexible memory skills um, and social manipulation. It's sort of a whole, a whole package of things. And I have to say that the COVIDs are probably ticking every box when we go through that. So they, they really do have a well-deserved reputation. Unlike the foxes, we have the scientific studies to show that they are sort of living up to their reputation to such an extent that they have been labeled feathered apes for the incredible similarity. They show this striking convergence in ability, uh, which is quite astounding given that the last common ancestor was at least 280 million years ago, something like that. So then we come on to the next part of the question, I think, which is how do they do it when their brains are so small? And if you think about the selective pressures that birds have, have gone through in their evolutionary history, it's really been jettisoning non-essential weight because they need to fly. That means they need to be light and efficient. So their brains are very small and very light. But what they do is they pack their brains full of neurons. So at a much higher density than mammal brains. So for something like corvid or a parrot, they might have the same number or even more neurons in the parts of their brains which are associated with higher cognitive abilities compared with a monkey. And we're not even correcting for body size here. So a monkey, which is bigger in absolute terms, might have actually fewer neurons in the parts of the brain that are associated with that. So birds have kind of got around that by structuring their brains very differently compared with mammals. Um, one of the other big differences is that they don't have what we think of probably as the typical brain structure. They don't have this wrinkly layer around the brain. It's called the neocortex. And the first anatomical studies of birds showed that they, they didn't have this, mammals do. And so the association came to be that mammals probably are more intelligent and it must be down to this wrinkly outer layer. We now know that birds have a functional analog in their brain, but it's structured differently. The neurons aren't in layers, they're in clusters. So next time I see a crow, I'll just remember it has an incredibly dense brain hanging out at the top of its body. That's amazing stuff. Thanks very much, Joe. And finally, we're very close to revealing our mystery sound. I have one last clue for you. I have sunk the unsinkable. And I'm also the sign of a planet in crisis. Does anyone have a final guess? Dave? I, I'm sticking, sticking with it. I've, uh, having thought of Titanic as the movie, then, uh, yeah, love the icebergs breaking off from ice sheets, I guess. Correct. It is. You're right. It's a glacier carving, which makes such an incredibly loud, roaring sound. Things the size of Jamaica, as we heard earlier. Well done, everybody. I'm afraid we must leave it here. Thank you very much for listening and for sending in your questions. And thank you very much to our panel as well. That's Dave Goulson, Jess Wade, Joe Wimpany and Kyle Harper. Next week, we're talking to scientists, inventors and farmers about their creative solutions to the climate crisis by sucking up carbon from the atmosphere using a variety of different plants. The Naked Scientist comes to you from the Institute for Continuing Education at the University of Cambridge and is supported by Rolls-Royce. I'm Eva Higginbotham and from all of us here at The Naked Scientists, goodbye. Goodbye.